and I'm going to keep an eye on the waiting room, but I'm now going to um, hand over to David. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, good morning, everybody. So my name's David Littlefair. I'm the Youth Engagement Project Coordinator who was overseeing um, tackling loneliness with transport as a part of our project with Department for Transport. Um, I sat centrally within Community Rail and managed our relationships with the various different partnerships that were involved in delivering the project. So I'm just going to do a couple of moments of worth of housekeeping, of which I'm sure many of you as regular Zoom users and attendees will probably all know uh, a lot of this very well at this point. Um, but just to have a quick recap. So firstly, if you could uh, rename yourself in uh, your video window, you'll see a set of three dots in the top right hand corner. You can click that to rename yourself, please. Put your name and the partnership that you're part of uh, in, in the name there so that we can tell who you are and where you're, uh, where you're asking from. Uh, secondly, the webinar is going to be recorded. So by being a part of this, uh, we'll record it and you'll be able to take that later. It'll be made available on the website. Uh, thirdly, at certain points during the webinar, we're going to have a set of breakout rooms. Um, you'll notice that you're, you'll all be on mute at the moment. Um, and can only use the chat box at the, at the moment if you if you need to say anything. Later on, when we go into the breakout rooms, uh, you'll be able to unmute and and, uh, and ask questions at, at that point. But or, as I'll say at the time, please use the raise hand function if you need to if you need to ask a question at that point. Um, if you have any kind of technical issues or or any kind of problems accessing the recording, the video, or anything like that today, uh, we're going to put Hazel's number in the chat box. You can text Hazel. Uh, to mention uh, what problems you might be having in our team, uh, we'll, we'll look to assist you in the background. Um, and finally, at the end of the day, uh, there'll be a, or at the end of the session, which is going to run for roughly two and a half hours, um, there'll be a, a feedback survey, which is anonymous, which will pop up in your Zoom window. So um, please answer that and give us some, some feedback. It's always really useful and helps us improve these webinars. Um, okay, so. As I mentioned, we're here to talk about the Tackling Loneliness with Transport project. Um, our first speaker is uh, our chief executive, Jules Townsend, who's going to run through uh, a, an overview of the project and why we took it on and what we look to achieve. So I'm going to pass now over to, to Jules. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you're all well. It's good, good to see you all. Um, really pleased that so many of you could uh, join us on this webinar to hear about the, the really exciting work that's been going on um, through this project and uh, to hopefully have some really good discussions, which is the, you know, I think uh, there's, a, there's a lot of time allocated during this session um, to that uh, for us to share ideas on how we can build a, a long term positive legacy from this project. Hannah, are you OK to share my slides, please? Um, so as David, moment, Jules, yep, yep. yeah, I'll just keep talking while, while you're doing that. Um, so um, as David said, I, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction um, so that we can then hand you over to the people who have been delivering the work and, and so you can hear about the, the details and the insights that, that have been emerging from, from what they've been doing. Um, and uh, just tell you a little bit about our, our initial thinking for the project, uh, some of our, our, our aims and objectives and um, and how we set the project up as a whole in order to build that, that lasting legacy. Are you there, hey, Hannah? Are you, uh... My computer's playing up, bear with me. You can I'll do it, ha Hannah, I'll do it. <laughs> bear with me. Oh, technical issues on the fourth minute of the webinar. Uh, hopefully this will be the, the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just keep talking. You don't need the slides. It's, it's fine. They're coming, um, they're coming. Thanks, thanks, Hazel. So how this project came about, uh, about a year and a half ago, we had, there they are, oh, hurrah. Uh, if you can flick straight to the second one. Thanks, thanks, Hazel. Um, so about a year and a half ago, we had the opportunity to bid into uh, a dedicated grant scheme being uh, run by the Department of Transport, um, looking to uh, explore how transport can help to address loneliness uh, and, and, and social isolation. Um, a one-off 
grant scheme, providing funding for projects for, for one year um, off the back of um, the cross-government strategy for tackling loneliness. Um, and uh, we, we were really interested in this. We, we, we were conscious that community rail, across the community rail movement, there were already um, some, some really fantastic projects going on uh, that were clearly delivering a positive impact in terms of uh, bringing people together, building social connections, building confidence, broadening mobility horizons, um, and, and, and therefore helping to tackle some of the key um, the key risk factors in, in, in uh, loneliness and, and isolation. Um, and indeed that had actually been recognized in, in the government's tackling loneliness strategy, some of you may remember a few years ago. Um, so, so we thought, you know, there's an opportunity here to build on that, that good work that's been going on in, in, in some locations across the country. Um, but also particularly to, to develop our evidence base. Um, so the DFT had a particular focus on not just funding some projects to help to tackle loneliness, but to um, really understanding the ways in which transport can be used uh, to, to, uh, to reduce loneliness. Um, so they were looking for projects that would be evidence led, but also really well evaluated uh, to increase our, our understanding of, of, of these issues. Um, we were also mindful of the fact that there, um, uh, many of you will be aware that um, we've been keen for a number of years to, to support members across across the community rail movement to, to strengthen uh, the work going on to engage with young people specifically. And we 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 are we identified, you know, a number of um reasons why it's it's really important i'm sure many of you will be conscious of, of the the reasons why it's really important that community rail works with young people um and and and, and engages and, and empowers young people to um to support them to access opportunities and um uh and 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 indeed to to, to feed in and, and be be a part of community rail uh, next slide please hazel There we go. Um, so we, on that basis, we we honed in 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 applying for 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 the for the grant for this project. We honed in on the opportunities for Community Rail to to really step up and develop its work, engaging with young people, in order to deliver you know a whole whole raft of of, of benefits for and and with younger age groups, which related to loneliness and. Um, and, and, and other issues and um, uh, and benefits that that young people could could um, access by by engaging with community rail. Um, and we were conscious of the evidence, and I think a lot of people perhaps um, aren't aware of this that that young people are uh, a very high risk group in relation to loneliness. Um, they're um, often at risk of mental health conditions that can increase loneliness risk. Um, and and sometimes uh, perpetuate a cycle of, of of loneliness and isolation. Um, we were conscious of emerging findings that young people uh, had been and, and continue to be particularly exposed to loneliness and isolation following on from the pandemic. Um, and we were aware of um, some of the existing evidence, and and this is uh, set out re really really well, really comprehensively in the paper in Miriam. Um, Miriam's paper that was, uh, I think, shared with you all as, as part of the papers for this um, webinar, um, the evidence that amongst young people, loneliness risk is, is, is strongly linked to um, young people's ability to you know, feel a sense of belonging for their uh, local spaces and places. It's linked to their ability to socialise and it's linked to their ability um, to access opportunity. And, the, and these are all factors that, that Community Rail has got a really strong, um, can play a really strong role in, 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 in addressing. Um, next slide, please, Hazel. So we were, we were very mindful of the fact that Community Rail could play a really powerful role in helping to uh, potentially um, reduce loneliness risk amongst young people specifically uh, by building 
um, confidence um, and skills in relation to public transport, which a lot of you will be very aware is often lacking, creating a sense of pride, ownership and, and belonging in relation to their local areas and wider regions, increasing access to opportunity uh, and to leisure and nature, um, and at the same time, building those social connections and, and, and sense of cohesion. And, and we were um, appreciative of the importance of engaging with young people on their on their terms and drawing on their ideas and creativity. And I think you'll see that coming through in the in the examples that you'll be hearing um, uh, about in just a second. Next slide, please, Hazel. So as I've mentioned, we used DFT funding. We were successful in getting the grant to set this project up. Uh, we worked very closely with uh, the University of the West of England, and you'll be hearing from Miriam in just a second about um, the role that she's played and, and, and lessons that she's helped to tease out from the project. Um, and we brought together um, and, and engaged with and drew on the knowledge and experience of um, three community rail partnerships and uh, a youth uh, organisation, Catch22, again, you'll be hearing from them in just a second, uh, to set up and, and coordinate and support the delivery of three pilot projects in, in different areas, um, um, with David coming into our team as the, as the overall coordinator. Um, next slide, please. This slide just shows you how that was set up. Um, so as I say, us, us providing a supportive um, role, but working very closely with Miriam to help the pilot projects to be evidence-led in their setup and making sure they were established in a way to, um, uh, that we could uh, assess their effectiveness, um, carry out that, that sound evaluation, a participatory approach to evaluation, and make sure there were lessons learned. And next slide, please, Hazel. Thank you. Um, and we we set it up in this way, um, partly because, you know, we wanted the three pilot projects to in themselves be really effective, but really important to us um, in, 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 in doing this was that we had uh, a, a way that we could share the lessons uh, across the community rail movement and build a lasting legacy from this project. So this project was about much more than the, the one year period and the three pilot projects themselves. It was about us setting it all up in a way that meant that we um, could evaluate those pilots, working with the young people that, that have engaged with them, and you'll, hearing, you'll be hearing more about that, um, and enabling us to share our learnings and, and guidance uh, with our members across Community Rail and across Britain um, on an ongoing basis. Obviously, this webinar is a big part of that, uh, but you will be hearing more from us in terms of um, a report coming out of the project and how we are integrating the learnings from this project in our general support work for members. Um, we're also looking at ongoing funding opportunities to enable us to support Community Rail to do more of this kind of work going forward um, and you know we believe there is scope for us to together um, help to reach and engage and empower tens of thousands of young people um, going forward um, on top of the 400 that, that are engaged in the project itself. Um, but gonna, I'm going to finish there. Um, I, I'm really keen as well to, to hear all your ideas and your responses to the findings and um, and lessons that have emerged from the three pilots. Um, you know, it's important that we have this ongoing conversation, I think, about how we can build on this um, really exciting work that's taken place in the past year, um, continue that and spread it out more widely. And I am going to hand over directly, mustn't forget, um, to Miriam Ricky, who's been really, really um, uh, crucial in, in, in supporting us to, to deliver this work. Um, over to you, Miriam. Thank you, Jules, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Miriam Ritchie, a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Transport and Society at UWE, and I'm going to share my screen now, uh, hopefully doing the right thing. Um, slideshow. So I hope you can uh, 
see my screen. Um, so I'm going to present um, the approach that we took for the evaluation. So it's an evidence-based participatory approach to designing and evaluating uh, the project. So I'm going to talk about my role in the project and how we work together. Um, I will also introduce the concept of loneliness and what interventions have been evidence that work um, in, in tackling it. So what's the evidence around loneliness and what works in tackling loneliness? Uh, I will then briefly summarize what um, the, the participatory approach that we use for the evaluation and the use of the so-called logic models. And then I will um, summarize and tell you how you uh, can benefit from this approach uh, to project design and evaluation, because you might want to ad adopt it yourself in your, in your work. Um, so my role in the project, um, I had a role in the three broad areas of the project. So project design, project evaluation, but also dissemination, such as this, this webinar. Um, so my, my research interest really is in um, community rail and uh, very applied uh, social work. So understanding uh, the relationship between transport and society, obviously, but with a, a very, very applied, um, uh, applied aspect, let's say. Um, in the project design, so I was very, very happy to collaborate with this, uh, with this program. Um, in the project design, I uh, undertook a, a review of evidence on loneliness, young people and transport that you um, have received as um, your package for this webinar. Um, and this was, um, I, I carried it out to support um, an evidence-based design of the pilot so that the pilots were designed with some kind of evidence uh, that they could draw upon. Um, the project evaluation was a participatory type of evaluation. So it wasn't just be dictating uh, what we were going to do, but it was very much a, a team work with all the partners involved. Um, so um, we set up the logic maps um, and monitor and evaluation plans for each pilot. And I will tell you about logic maps in a second. Um, and these were co-designed with the pilot leads and the community rail network. Um, I also supported data collection and um, undertaking data analysis and interpretation. And some of it is still ongoing, but um, as Jules uh, said, there will be a report that I'm sure will be shared with you. And then um, I will support with dissemination and, and reporting, as I said. So um, what is loneliness? So we hear a lot about loneliness, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic, because loneliness is a big problem. It can affect anyone. Um, so we are all at risk of loneliness. Um, and sorry, some, um, it is different from social isolation, although uh, the two terms are, are used um, in the same context, there is a slight difference in that social isolation is uh, something that can be objectively measured. So it, it, it's, um, it's based on the number of people in a person's social network. Uh, loneliness, it's more subjective. So it's a feeling. And this feeling occurs when there is a gap between a person's actual and desired social relationships. This means that um, we feel lonely when, when there is a gap between what we have in terms of the quality and quantity of our social connections and what we would like to have. And it's very personal, really. So that's why probably there is a bit less um, evidence because it is more complex to um, measure. Um, as Jules has already um, said in her introduction, so I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in this, uh, loneliness, um, young people are um, very much at risk of loneliness. In fact, more than any other age group, although uh, loneliness has, um, during the past uh, uh, decades been more associated with older generations, but actually data from um, the Office from Na for National Statistics uh, has demonstrated that this is not the case. And in fact, uh, young people are three times as likely than older people to report feeling loneliness. And this has only exacerbated uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So uh, what does the evidence say about the causes or the determinants of loneliness and also about what we can do to tackle loneliness? So these slides summarize my uh, paper. So um, it's going to be brief, but if you want to know more, of, of course, you can, uh, you can read that paper. So what are the causes or the, the determinants? Um, so the evidence, the research that has been conducted about loneliness um, identifies some kind of individual related characteristics such as sociodemographics, poor mental health and physical health, uh, disability and low self-esteem, low uh, confidence as factors that can determine loneliness. But also there are kind of more external factors as well and community related factors, for example, lacking a sense of connection or belonging to the local community, uh, not having friends or rarely meeting with friends or family and feeling disconnected or distrustful of others, all of these contributes to loneliness. So what can we do to tackle loneliness? What interventions can we um, adopt? So ad interventions that make it more acceptable to discuss loneliness and reducing the stigma are very useful. Encouraging positive use of social media because social media can be obviously bad in certain aspects, for example, cyberbullying and trolling, but it can also uh, link people with other like-minded people. Um, involving users to co-design and provide input into their intervention is quite useful for loneliness and also creating opportunities for people to connect meaningfully to each other through group activities that might not have anything to do with loneliness uh, but have a, um, um, create a connection between people and also um, in, engage people in social action where they can see um, how they can bring benefit to society. Um, also promoting and using social local assets and community spaces for activities, which has been done obviously in this project, and developing users' personal skills and confidence in an environment that, that is safe for them. So all of this has been the basis, the evidence basis for the three pilots. Then um, I mentioned that we use the logic model as a tool for for um, evaluation. The logic model is also known as the intervention logic or logic map, and in some cases is the basis of the so-called theory of change that you might have uh, heard of, but I won't go into those details. So the logic model is a visual representation of how a project or a program or an intervention achieves its desired aims. So it shows that what inputs have been put into the, the, the project, uh, what outputs came out of it, uh, what outcomes are expected in the short and medium terms, and how these outcomes then will produce the objectives and impacts in the longer term. To give you an example based on our project, inputs can be money, so the DFT funding stuff, but also immaterial um, elements such as knowledge um, and um, you know the, the knowledge that every, that every member of staff has and their experience, but also facilities and tools. The outputs are, as in our case, rail visits, workshop and all the events, and you will hear about this uh, in the next uh, presentations. The outcomes, in our case, we wanted to improve the confidence in the young people, their personal and travel skills. We wanted them to have a greater sense of connection to people and places, and also to have expanded travel horizons, uh, thanks to uh, the community rail work. And so in our objective, as Jules said, um, it was to reduce the risk of loneliness, but also an increased propensity to use rail in their daily life. And this was actually the, the, the reason we got the funding, the, the, the funding from the FT was, in fact, to tackle loneliness. Um, so how we use the logic model, um, as this is the vi visual representation, it can be used in for two different things. One is to design the project as we have done, but also to evaluate the project. So having all the, the project is illustrated in this way, in this di diagrammatical way, uh, help us to identify what evaluation questions um, are important to us and to our funders and to how to answer those evaluation questions. So uh, for example, um, for the inputs, we could ask were the input sufficient and timely? So did we have enough staff? Uh, where the, was the funding enough? Um, for the outputs, the evaluation questions might include, did all the plan 
planned activities take place uh, and did the participants enjoy taking part? These are just examples of all the, the range of questions, of course. And in terms of outcomes in the short and medium terms, these were all obviously the ones that we could measure because the evaluation um, won't continue after the uh, end of the project. So we cannot really uh, measure longer term um, impacts or outputs but, or outcomes, but we can, um, we can measure those that have been achieved during the duration of the project. And the evaluation questions that we've asked ourselves um, were to what extent did participants improve their personal and travel skills? and to what extent did the participants make meaningful connections to people and places and many others. I mean, I couldn't put all of them in the slide. So how do we, did we answer the evaluation questions? We use different uh, sort of um, research method tools. Uh, we also use the progress reports that we had compiled for DFT, but we also um, carried out uh, interviews with delivery staff and the pilot leads were key in doing all this, um, this work because the evaluation was participatory. Um, they also had an input in the questions that were being asked and they actually um, did this bit of work themselves. And we also had questionnaire surveys for the young people taking part in the workshops and in the rail visits. Again, the questions, we developed them together. Um, and we also have evaluation workshops at the end of the pilots, towards the end of the pilots or projects within the pilots um, with participants and also the project partners. So it was a kind of jigsaw that we built with all different types of data, more qualitative and more quantitative. And this is some ongoing work that I'm um, also doing at the moment. Miriam, we're just yes. coming to the, sort of the end of the allotted yeah. amount of time so we can send these overviews of the logic model and how they look yes. uh, to everybody attending now. But I think at the moment, if we're going to run to time, we probably need to hand over to Katie there. Yes. Although yeah, that's I... obviously really, really useful and interesting. Yes. But Thank I think you. the next bit I, we might have to yeah, pass on. David, to just apolo apologies because I think. I handed over slightly late to Miriam, so we can, we can give her a few more That's minutes. fine. I'm not going to, to, to say uh, anything about this. It was just an illustration of what it might look like. So this is a logic model for a pilot two that Kate is going to talk about, but I'm, I'm not going to say anything about it. Just to conclude, this is my final slide, um, how you can benefit um, from this approach. Um, so as I said, logic model help design intervention and evaluate interventions using evidence and gathering evidence. And if you want to use logic models, it's, it's going to be quite um, helpful to demonstrate the value of your organization, of your program or project to your funders. And this is really important in a very competitive environment where a lot of people are competing for the same funds. And this is, can be useful at the bridge stage uh, to secure the funding, but also when you report your results. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, you will have uh, my contact details. I'm going to be with UE until the 31st of July, and then I'll probably just be an independent researcher, but please connect on LinkedIn uh, if you want to um, connect with me. Uh, so I will now hand over to Katie Douglas, who uh, is um, our second panelist, uh, who is Accessibility and Inclusion Officer at uh, Community Rail Lancashire. Over to you, uh, Katie. Thank you. Um, here we go. Thank you very much and uh, good morning and I uh, just really appreciate the time to share a little bit about what Community Rail Lancashire got up to as part of this project. Um, I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes and I've, I'm conscious I've put quite a lot of words on the screen rather than images, but I think other presenters later on will have lots of lovely images to share as well. Um, so what did we get up to as part of this project? Uh, there were four main broad objectives that were threaded throughout our delivery and um, with each of them centred on supporting our participants to increase in confidence and a sense of belonging to place and community. Yeah, we did want to encourage and support people to use our wonderful rail network, but in order to do that with people that were at risk of loneliness, we felt that it was important to support them to develop in self-confidence, community and connectedness. We needed to work Trans tackling loneliness with transport into uh, an engagement and delivery process that was going to do that. 
We recognize Katie, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but your slides are not showing. Oh, it's still saying loading. And if there's an issue, we can share for you. That's interesting. Um, I'll try again. Could we, could we do that, please, Hazel? Would it be okay to to use the slides that we've got in in house, Katie? Um. I can yeah. certainly do that if you need me to. Let's, let's just try one more time. That it's yeah, it looks like it's coming up now. Oh no, it's still loading. Yeah, is it not working? Sorry, Katie. I, I think I it's coming from the internet. Yeah, it's coming directly from the internet, isn't it, Katie? So I'll I'll share screen if that's okay. If you stop sharing, okay. Thank you. Let's go. Oh, sorry, I've got the chat open. Let me close that. Okay, is that okay? Can everyone see that? Yes, I can. So, so I'm going to see if other people can okay. as well. Right, so if you just tell me when to move on, Katie. Sorry about the delay, everyone. It's all good. Thank you. Um, yeah, we recognise that full realisation of these objectives is a longer term aspiration than that which was going to be achievable within the time scale, time scale and the scope of this particular project. However, we hoped that it could be a catalyst for those involved to start on the journey to achieving independent mobility, uh, increased access to social, educational and economic opportunities, the benefits of using sustainable and local travel options and positive mental and physical health. We wanted to work with uh, 16 to 24 year olds primarily, although as we will later see, we incorporated intergenerational engagement opportunities within with both younger and older participants as well. Why did we do this? All age groups benefit from connecting to others and the siloing of communities into age defined brackets I, we felt was detrimental to everybody. And by breaking up communities in whatever way, we are creating opportunities for distrust, isolation and loneliness to take hold. How did we want to work and why? Well, we wanted to split our delivery into four creative projects, dance, poetry, art and music that participants took part in alongside journey planning workshops and real experience days. We wanted to create opportunities for participants to connect a place to each other and their wider community. And I really can't state this enough to connect to who they are, their skills, their feelings, their creativity, their hopes and their dreams. Loneliness is rooted in the disconnection and the absence of belonging. And if this project was really going to reach the aim of tackling loneliness, we needed to find a way for those involved to develop in a positive sense of self and a sense of belonging to community and place. And lastly, where do we want to work? Well, Community Rail Lancashire has worked in and around Blackburn for quite a, some time. So that was a really happy home for us. We can go to the next slide, please. I've highlighted making connections as we decided early on that we would avoid the word loneliness. Loneliness, um, we felt, was a loaded term with negative and quite stigmatised associations. And as we've heard from Miriam, most of us will be lonely at some stage in our lives. But we were concerned that we'd do possibly more harm than good if we were overt with the word um, that can lead people to feelings of shame, guilt and powerlessness. Um, so we flipped it, um, we and making connections was born. Our age range and location were also rooted in the realities that um, 16 to 24 year olds are disproportionately likely to report feelings of loneliness, are commonly at risk of mental health conditions which increase the risk of loneliness and create mutually reinforcing patterns of perpetuation. Um, by which I mean there can be a cyclical effect. Loneliness can lead to poor mental health, which in turn can lead back 
lead to further isolation and loneliness and onwards. And this age group was particularly exposed to loneliness and isolation due to the pandemic, which this project followed closely on the heels of. And the map on the slide shows that ONS data that uh, Miriam touched on, um, saying that showing where people say that they're often or always lonely and the darker area show higher concentration. Um, you can see Blackburn there is a really dark spot um, with 18% of people feeling saying that they feel often or always lonely. And that's two in 10 people and young people being more significantly affected post pandemic. Next slide, please. So what did we actually do on the ground? Well, having worked in Blackburn for some time, Community Rail Lancashire could reach out to trusted local partners that we've previously worked with. We've worked with Nightsafe, Arts to Heal, Blackburn College and Cross Hills um, SEND School, and they all fit into that category. Whereas Dance Syndrome and Blackburn Youth Zone were new partners for us to work with. As part of the legacy to this project, um, those two organisations are now working together on another dance-based project that may well include the rail network in some way. Uh, we recruited four creative practitioners and apart from Banu Adam, the other three were also new, uh, new to us. And we're really pleased to have developed and expanded that pool of practitioners that understand our approach to youth and community work. Um, the delivery involved, as I said, creative workshops with pre professional leads um, and also journey planning workshops and rail experience trips. Um, these resulted in several tangible outcomes, a new large scale artwork in Blackburn Station subway, poetry posters, a new album that's hosted online and a dance piece inspired by the movement of the passengers on our network all of which were shared as in within a series of celebration events. Um, by taking a modular approach, um, we were able to manage our resources, the money, and also our time capacity. And we held regular reflections meetings with local rail industry partners, um, which gave us opportunity to share ideas and highlight potential risks. We also filmed everything um, the final version of which is um, being put together at the moment. Uh, next slide, please, which may or may not work because I don't know if the links will work, but maybe give it a shot. <laughs> Some audio. Um, no, probably not. Oh, man, that looks unhelpful. No worries. Don't worry. Um, you can go back to the slides that will sorry bear with me i'm not sure how okay. to get out of that katie access denied right there we go we're back at the slides cool. uh, yeah i don't think the audios are going to work yeah that's no problem um so on this slide it's just a, a num just a few different parts of the project um we worked uh throughout throughout the throughout the kind of overview of the program um with the with various various people saying various things about the project and um, if we flip to the next slide that would be great thank you yeah i was just going to say they may well work when it's um when people have access later so okay and the commitment of the partners that we were able to work with. Um, I have mentioned them already, but to give a bit more detail, uh, we work with Nightsafe, a charity that supports young people who have or are experiencing homelessness. Arts to Heal, which is a local powerhouse of creativity that works with people who are either experiencing or at risk of poor mental health. Uh, Cross Hills Special Educational Needs School, Dance Syndrome, a dance company that primarily works with people who are learning disabled. Blackburn College's ESOL, uh, English as a Second or Other Language Department, and Blackburn Youth Zone. And of course, uh, we work with Northern, 
So it's quite a list of different partners that were all involved. So I've, I really feel like I'm here representing all of that. And um, it wouldn't have happened with, without that. And the benefits of working in partnership are absolutely huge. Um, these guys are, are embedded and they're trusted within their communities in Blackburn. They know and understand the people and the place far more than I could um, or, you know, or do or could. Um, they're connected to each other. Night Safe and Arts to Heal um, work together, for instance. Um, as well as they were able to bring other people in the project. So we had the Blackburn Mayor join us for celebration events, which came out of a partnership, net, a partnership connection um, from Arts to Heal. And then but beyond that, um, they're able to continue to work together after the project has, um, has come to a close. The transport tackling loneliness with transport or making connections as it became on our case was always going to stop there was always a time a time frame that that was going to work they were going to work within so by working with partners there's not there doesn't need to be a complete decampment um, after the end of the project by working with other partners we were able to expand the scope of delivery so the number of participants around 150 people the locations we work within and the physical outputs that were created um, despite quite a short delivery period there are loads more benefits but i do want to stress this last one as crucially important um, especially when working with people who are at risk of loneliness or vulnerable in other ways. By working with pre-existing community partners who have already got those long-term relationships with people they're working with, we were able to ensure that they were supported during and after the project timeframe. So with that timeframe, there's a cutoff period. Um, it's, it's really important to CRL and community rel, I hope, as, as a whole to, to think about what happens to those people who have started developing their self-confidence, their sense of community and connectedness, who's going to continue to support people after the end of a project. And that's where our community partners really come into their own. But, and it is a big, big but, working in partnership isn't one way. Um, community Rail Lancashire, we needed to understand and respect the ecology of the community partners, how do they work? How do we fit into what they're already doing? It's really crucial to ensure that the responsibilities and the expectations aren't assumed. So being really clear on who is doing what and when. Um, bad feelings can rise really quickly um, when people discover, if they discover that they're working at cross purposes, especially if that could have been avoided, if there'd be more clarity um, earlier on. So communication is key and getting those catch ups in, even if you don't think that there's something to talk about, I would recommend to do. And lastly, and it may seem like this points towards a lack of trust, but I would suggest that getting the basics in writing is really important so that everybody knows they're on the same page and they're moving in the same direction. And next slide, please. Thank you. It may sound like um, things went really, really well, and, and I do think they did, but there were some challenges and hiccups along the way. Um, so facilitating unexpected developments, some of these projects grew and grew and grew, and it was a bit of a balancing act between responding to what was happening and keeping things on track. Um, word of mouth meant that in some elements, the participant numbers increased week on week, whereas in other elements, actually recruiting participants proved difficult, even though we were working with local partners. So we needed to stay flexible and expand the reach, um, the partners involved, and to a certain extent, be a little bit flexible with some of the timescales. Um, as always, the weather, we had snow in March, so that caused us some problems with rail excursions um, and also ch changes on the railway with industrial action and maintenance at Blackburn Station. 
um, all kind of threw a spanner in the works along the way. But Katie, oh, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but on the subject of um, flexible timings, we're, we're on about, we've got about a minute left. I know there's been some IT issues good. there. I'm sorry about good. that. One. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so that really, I just want to just stress that just to really avoid those knee jerk reactions and hold on to those overall objectives of the project, um, even when it doesn't always go to plan and just know and remember that you really are making a positive difference even if you're not always sure quite where and when and how that's happening and my final slide just to say thank you so much for listening despite the technical challenges um and to all the people that i'm representing just wanted to to make sure that everybody's aware that it's not me who's done all this i'm just the spokesperson for the day but thank you very much and I'm passing over to Gareth from Catch22. Morning all, thank you very much, Katie. Um, hi all, it's great to meet with you, albeit online. Um, if you bear with me, I will just share my screen, but I think Katie, you are still on there. Can people see that? Or David, can you see that? I can see it, yeah. Uh, please let us know in the chat if you can't. Is that okay for everybody? That's fine. Okay, lovely, right. So um, thank you very much for joining us today. What I wanted to start by saying is got got 20 minutes and, and to rush through kind of a, a, a 10 month program in, in 20 minutes is obviously very difficult. I want to bring the salient points to you and show what the, the positives were, but actually sometimes it's quite hard. So I've tried to put some visual elements in there as well, but please, when we get a chance later, ask any questions, but I, I'll, it's been such a, an amazing opportunity. I have to say that um, it's been powerful. Trying to capture some of the feedback from some of the young people has been really, really um, interesting. Um, but I hope I can do kind of some service to, to what they actually did. So Catch 22, we called our program Connected. How do I get rid? Can you all see yourselves down there? Can I get rid of that? Oh, no, I can't. Um, can people see all, all all the faces there, or is that just me? No, it, people can select speak of you. They oh. select their own view. Don't worry, Gareth. It's okay. up to each individual. No problem. I've jumped past one of my slides, but that's just me trying to get rid of people's faces. <laughs> um, Catch Twenty Two is a national charity, so we were kind of the 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 foreigners to the the party, really. Um, we deliver all sorts of programs up and down the country, and I think we were called upon because we had great connections in the northeast. One thing that we started off by doing is that we our experience of working on the National Citizen Service, which we try to dovetail it with a little bit, is that we understand the young people like an identity. And one of the things that we did is we provided every participant of the programme with a T-shirt, as a, a connected T-shirt, as a memento of their, their participation, which might sound kind of gimmicky to some, but actually they loved it. And every time they turned up to an intervention, they were all wearing their connected T-shirts. So I just thought it was kind of worth saying they don't cost an awful lot of money. But for us, it was something that really, really worked. Why did I want to get involved in this? I wanted to get involved in this because I've got a lot of passion. I've got a lot of interest. I've got 30 years of youth work experience. Um, I've been working on the National Citizen Service in the Northeast for the last 11 years. And it was for me that I'd witnessed the, an increasing amount of mental health issues in young people during that NCS programme. Um, and a lot of people with kind of lacking of confidence, not wanting to make friends. And the NCS was all about making friends. So I wanted to kind of bring that part, that kind of experience uh, and our kind of resources to that uh, to that fold. Um, I'm passionate about uh, empowering young people uh, and helping themselves to make a difference to them. Uh, their, their own kind of opportunities and like I said I've worked for kind of 10 or 11 years in the NCS and also it sounded something different it was a new opportunity I thought I got a lot of passion that I can bring to this um, and I was really really keen to make sure that it was a, a, a raging success what were our object objectives well, it's already been touched upon by Miriam at the start um, and it showed that kind of uh, certain percentages in the northeast were at risk of loneliness or, or depicting as being lonely, 8.3% in kind of Durham, and then it was even higher in Newcastle. And like I said, on the NCS, we were we were aware of that. 
we would we would deliver programs and young people would turn up with headphones on and I thought they were all listening to kind of a live concert but actually it just meant that they had no confidence in in their social circles and and they wanted to live in their own little bubble and I thought okay this really backs up what the the office of national statistics have said our objectives for this so what we decided to do is we'll, every young person that joined our program we delivered uh, an awareness campaign um, through kind of looking at kind of what is loneliness, what is isolation, what are the triggers, what are the barriers, what are the coping mechanisms. So there was, a, there was some information that we provided them that hopefully would support them themselves. And then there was additional activities that we built on from that. Um, some of those activities, we pride ourselves on delivering kind of youth leg at, youth led activities. So those activities um, were kind of in discussion was what do you want to get out of this? How do you want to improve? What could you do? It's quite easy for us to give up a timetable and create a timetable of activ activities and interventions that they would just participate in. But our experience has been that if they're involved in the planning and the preparation, then their participation is often greater. Um, and so we were very keen to make sure that they kind of um, they were involved in their planning and they come up with ideas themselves. The other ob objectives were to increase their social connections with others and make, make sure that they felt part of something bigger. Again, a lot of these young people were working with it within schools or within colleges in small groups because of their, their, their risk of exclusion from um, social circles. So we wanted to make sure that they kind of they were involved uh, and, and that we kind of promoted their, their kind of their confidence building. And we also... Uh, some of you may or know may or may not know something called skills builder, but we kind of measured their their skills builder kind of capabilities. That's so that's listening, speaking, problem solving, creativity, aiming high, leadership, teamwork, staying positive. So we asked them kind of where were they at at the start of the program? Where were their problem solving skills on a scale of kind of one to one to five? What was their what was their teamwork and what was their staying positive? So we did that at the start and we did that at the end and and through that we were able to kind of judge kind of the the success stories and also it was something that we could also leave with as, as a legacy to schools and colleges so that we could provide them with some additional information so that they we're only short term intervention but the schools and colleges were going to we're going to be continuing working with these young people and we could say look you know this person has progressed here however they're still saying they're not particularly confident in a b or c so that was part of our objectives our target audience was people from the northeast so basically um we worked with nine schools and further education colleges from the northeast including county durham newcastle and tyneside it was newcastle college bishop auckland college we have two catch 22 college colleges at Bishop Auckland and Peter Lee uh, Jarrow Hall College, which works with um, special educational needs students, UTC Northern Futures and the Oaks, which is an SEND school in Spennymore, New College Durham. And then the Spotlight Music Project, which is based in uh, South Shields. What did we do? Like I said, we delivered a short intervention. So three sessions based around isolation. So we were looking at what the signs, what were the causes, what were the coping mechanisms and how could we improve their resilience and, and how could we kind of run and facilitate a number of activities that they were also involved with that would improve these kind of elements and reduce their social isolation. OK, um, some of these were planned. So we did a number of train challenges. We we planned them in advance. So basically, for example, we did a train challenge from Newcastle across the Tyne Valley line to Carlisle. Um, basically, the group would get on and they, they, there's a, an interactive um, treasure hunt type challenge that they could do that as they pulled into each station, there was a question. And we, we want to, we, it can be made as an online thing. The Tyne Valley line, who were absolutely fantastic in supporting us with this, were really keen to kind of take it on board. Um, we also did want to go into... Um, uh, the uh, the railway museum in Shildon called Locomotion. They were also really, really keen and the Bishop Auckland line were really supportive and they really wanted to take on some of the activities that we did. So we planned them in advance, but we also got the young people to go, right, okay, rather than doing this, let's do our own. So we got some young people to kind of come up with their own kind of train challenges as well um, that we could utilize. Um, like I said, 
very, very keen to make sure that the young people are involved. We did a group, uh, some facilitation with a group from New College Durham and said, what do you want to get out of this? And what's going to help you? And the two things that they said is one is they wanted to meet more people, but they wanted to have a greater confidence in utilising the rail system. So we looked at kind of utilising train apps. We looked at booking train tickets, et cetera, et cetera, and improving their confidence. And they also said, ironically, that they, they'd never used the metro system. So we actually did a couple of days where we literally took them on the metro and went from metro station to metro station and showed them how it kind of worked, how it could be incorporated. Um, and all, it all culminated with fish and chips uh, at the beach, which they were thrilled with. Um, what I would also say is that some of the community rail partnerships that we worked with were absolutely fantastic. And some of the, the train lines were absolutely superb. Um, with utilising um, uh, uh, some of the, the schools who had SEND students, um, having kind of transportation assistance was absolutely fantastic. And actually that in itself supported young people who had mechanical wheelchairs and electronic wheelchairs. And they realised that actually they can get on a train. All they needed to know is that there's somebody there that they can contact. And actually that was really quite empowering. They realised that actually this isn't a barrier. My wheelchair doesn't need to be a barrier that I can actually get on. And as simple as that might sound, it really, really was very, very kind of empowering for them. Um, and like I said, we also did kind of some specific kind of educational ones where we took them to the Hancock Museum at Newcastle and, and the, the Navy Museum in Hartlepool also. We also ran a poster and a leaflet campaign where we got all the participants to come up with kind of posters about kind of promoting tackling loneliness and isolation. Um, and as a result of that, we did a final competition. We had a competition winner, which I will end the presentation with at the very end with their their competition, their, their winning uh, design. We also had a music project and you hopefully I'll get a chance if I can rush a little quickly, you'll get a little snapshot of what they provided on their music project. So basically I wanted to just kind of give, give some kind of visuals rather than me talking. So this was the Bishop Auckland College. Um, again, they'd never, they, they, they utilized the local museum, which was the, uh, the Locomotion Museum in Shildon, which is the smaller sister museum of the National Railway Museum in York. It was on their doorstep. It's literally only five minutes, but we worked out that if we go via Darlington, they've got a bigger experience and they spent 50 minutes on the train and they came up with an amazing kind of train challenge where they had questions that they had to ask for the, uh, and pose for other groups. The college were thrilled with it. The college have taken it on board and the college want to utilize it uh, as a day trip out as a, re as a reward for some of the successes and achievements for the, some of the young people within uh, their own college. This was Catch-22 Peter Lee College where they took them to the Navy Museum. Again, this was one where we realized we had a couple of wheelchair users. And like I said, having that, that facility, and, and, and it really was absolutely quality, the way that people bent over backwards. And that just to see a smile on a young, people, young person's face to see that I can actually get on a train, as I've already said, was absolutely phenomenal for ourselves. We also had Jarrow Hall, where we ran a slightly different campaign for this. So we actually kind of took them to a local residential site up in Hexham. We got them to do a number of different activities there. Um, again, wheelchair users as well. And they also realized that kind of, you know, the provision out there and services out there for them to engage with was absolutely fantastic. And they really got lots from it and they got to try new experiences. And again, that was actually one of the most powerful ones that we did. Uh, and the, the feedback scores from them was just absolutely unbelievable, to be fair. And then the last one we did was this one, which was um, from New College Durham. And hopefully there is. They also joined in connection with a local music group called Spotlight. And they created a song which is only about a minute and a half. So if, if you'll allow me, I would like to play the song. And hopefully it, uh, it will do some justice if this will play. Yeah, that's fine, Karen. Sitting in my room, there's nothing to do. Don't wanna stay inside, I'd rather be with you. Face to face, just like the good old days. 
wake up every day and I wonder why I'm stuck by myself with me in eyes So I get on the train like a Oh, it's cut out, I apologise I call my mates, I say I'm on the way We have a laugh about the other day Oh, how I miss this Oh, how I miss this I stay on the phone till I arrive My head's much better, I've now got drive I hope people could actually hear the lyrics of that. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a good little song, but actually the lyrics are really, really powerful about how they've missed being out and about with friends and and, and not being able to spend time with them. Um, it actually is very, very powerful. And again, the feedback from them was phenomenal. Um, oh, there again. So some of the problems, it wasn't all um, roses and, and potpourri. Some of the pro problems that we had was um, for ourselves, uh, an insufficient lead in time i hope that's okay to say i, d I think that if you're going to do things well then you want to have kind of time to get it planned and get it ready however because we've been working in the northeast for so long we had all the contacts we had um contacts from schools and colleges so we could kind of overcome that as a barrier the industrial strike action caused lots of problems for us um, and trying to fit in with schools and colleges saying that we've got parent permission and guardian permission for a trip going out on a certain day and then it gets cancelled. We can't just reschedule it for kind of the next Thursday. It doesn't quite work like that. So that kind of had quite a, a, an impact for ourselves. Um, and also we had a, a little bit of a problem recruiting kind of a support worker for myself. But what we did is we utilised a lot of the fabulous NCS staff um, and, and kind of we, we got around it that way. We also did actually have a derailment on the Tyne Valley line going over to Carlisle and it was shut for about eight weeks. So that put the kibosh on that as well also. So we overcame it and we kind of worked up other things that we could do along the lines of when asking the young people, let's go along to the and use the metro systems instead. So achievements. I won't go through them all, but we had 173 people participated in our connected program. Um, fifth, over 53 percent of them identified as having some kind of disability. Um, over 500 intervention places were delivered to those. So it basically meant that they all had more than three activities, each young person. Um, their pulse score. So when we were talking about kind of where they were happy at the start of the program, basically the pulse score in, improved for for most of the participants i'm struggling here because i can't get rid of faces so i can't see some on my own type um post-trip survey showed that 66 participants felt more inspired to go outdoors and get out there which to me that that speaks volumes two-thirds uh, and the whole thing is about tackling loneliness so two-thirds felt more empowered to do so um 88% of the interventions took place, like I said, so were some that were cancelled a lot because of the industrial action, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the post-train questionnaires that we that we carried out, um, because of today, they felt more travelling by the train. 56% of people said that they felt more confident in travelling by train. So to me, if we can make an impact on one, and that wouldn't be very good justification for value for money, but if 56% of those 173 said they now felt more confident in traveling by train then i think we've done a, a fabulous job personally speaking um 86 percent of those 173 said that they spend, enjoyed spending time with others and actually some of those were with new people so we had a group from new college durham and i'm conscious of dime david before you chip in on me um i am aware of it i'm looking at the i'm looking at alexa next to me and she's telling me the time um but basically, we had a group then and they, they wouldn't talk to each other within the group. They wouldn't eat with each other in public. Um, and the tutors actually came to us at the end of the said, we've never seen this before. People are actually speaking to each other within the group. They're sitting down uh, and having a cafe and having a cafe Nero and actually talking to each other and eating in public. And they said, we've never, ever seen that. That's just a one statement of this whole kind of feedback. 
but that was really, really significant for those young people. So much so that two parents even rang in and said, whatever this programme is, the college need to run it again. And New College Durham really wanted to be part of it if it ever ran again. And 64%, which I thought was quite ironic, discovered new places that they didn't even know about in their own local Northeast community. Um, and a lot of them felt inspired to get outdoors and, and be more um, more participating with other people and see what was out and about. That said, we ran a poster campaign. The prize was that their poster would be put up in poster cages around Durham City Centre. And so, it's, so the winning poster is going to go up in six poster cages. Um, the, the winning poster came from New College Durham. New College Durham were thrilled when I contacted the carer to get permission to, to have it printed up. I didn't realise it at the time, but their, their, the, the carer was the gran and they said that their, their grandson had autism and uh, ADS, uh, ADHD and they were absolutely thrilled that anybody had ever taken on board anything that, that they'd ever done um, and their winning poster campaign that they, sub, that they supplied was that, which I thought was really quite simple and straightforward. Um, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And that was Owen from New College Durham. And I think if Alexa's correct, that's my time up. <clears throat> so for me, thank you for your time. I hope uh, I hope people got something from that. Like I said, it's quite difficult to do it in a 20 minute snapshot to sing all the songs, sing all the praises. But I'd like to hand over now, if I can, to Troy and Elaine from Gloucestershire and Sevenside Community Rail Programme. Thank you, Gareth. I'm going to try to go into this presentation without crying because I'm admittedly feeling a little bit emotional from that song. It was so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'll just bring up my screen now. Hopefully everything goes to plan. Can everyone see that OK? Yes, I can. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so my name's Elaine McDonald. I'm a community rail officer with Gloucestershire Community Rail Partnership, and I'm joined today with Troy Tanska, who um, is my colleague at Severnside CRP. Together, we have worked on pilot one for the Tackling Loneliness with Transport project, which we have called Movement. Um, pilot one's kind of unique in that it's the only pilot in this project where two CRPs have been working together. And our approach to tackling loneliness with transport has been working with young people from kind of inner city and urban areas and improving their access to nature via rail. Um, so kind of casting our sights back to the beginning of the project and why we chose this model around access to nature by rail. Um, on the left here, you'll kind of see a breakdown of some of the research and learnings that influenced our project model, which Miriam spoke about earlier as well. So we know that young people in this age bracket experience staggering amounts of social isolation, especially post pandemic, and that spending time outdoors really does improve well-being. We also know that underrepresented communities um, don't always feel welcome or able to access natural environments. And what we mean here by intersectional disadvantages, increasing risk of loneliness is essentially that young people experience experiencing one form of disadvantage, um, like socioeconomic, for example, might have overlapping kind of inequities around gender, race, disability, etc. Uh, so we thought of how rail could be an enabler to improve well-being for young people with all of that in mind. And in the short term, we essentially wanted to give young people a chance to connect with their peers and to connect, connect with new kind of natural environments. But long term, we really wanted to give them a chance to develop their confidence using rail with the understanding that that opens so many doors for other life opportunities beyond the end of the project. So with all of that in mind and a model in place for tackling loneliness through access to nature, we set out the following outcome ambitions for ourselves. So we wanted young people to get experience using the train to feel more confident traveling independently one day and have a better idea of places they could get to by train and um, to have, you know, a day out with their friends to bond with their peers to have, pos you know, develop positive relationships and kind of improve their confidence in their social situa situations and ultimately to, to have a greater sense of um, self-esteem. So um, we relied 
in, in order to reach the young people that we knew would benefit most from this project, Troy and I relied quite a lot on building trusted relationships with community partners that were already working with those young people. Um, and in order to kind of identify those partners, we asked ourselves some fundamental questions at the beginning. So we really needed to know kind of who are we and uh, as individuals and as community rail partnerships and, and what, of, what are our strengths, what are our strategic goals. So, for example, both Gloucestershire CRP and Severnside CRP really look at inclusion through the lens of diversity. So we knew we really wanted to focus on that in this project and needed to make sure we were working with partners who values aligned with that. But also kind of as Katie mentioned earlier, we wanted to make sure that we were adding value to what our partners are really good at and what they were already delivering for young people locally. So by asking ourselves these questions, we learned we really needed kind of a wide portfolio of partners we were going to work with. Otherwise, those most at risk of isolation and most likely to be marginalized wouldn't necessarily get access to the offer. And because of that, we kind of focused a lot on smaller grassroots organizations that tend to be in our areas more specialized and experienced with hard to reach groups, but often they have limited time and resources. So we built in a lot of time in the beginning of, of the, the project to focus on developing those relationships, understanding that it might take them longer to respond and longer to build up that trust and capacity. But I think it's really, really important to note that just because those smaller grassroots organizations can take longer to engage does not mean it's not worth doing that because, you know, often they are the best at, at, at you know, reaching those hard to reach communities. So we have thought about kind of what our model was, the young people we wanted to reach, the goals of our CRPs and kind of what the right partners were for the project. So we approached partners and, um, and there was a lot of time that went into building those relationships, not only explaining the offer, but really building that trust. And Troy and I can both kind of attest to how that momentum really does build over time. So, so much of our kind of delivery program was focused on that relationship building and focusing on how we were, you know, communicating that offer and making it as easy for those smaller organizations as possible. Um, so, you know, one org organization's version of easy might be that you handle absolutely everything and plan every part of the trip and they just turn up on the uh, on the day. But someone else's version of easy might be getting to collaborate with you every step of the way. So in that process, it's really important to get to know your partners and what they need and how you can add value to that. And also get to know the young people. What are they interested in and what sort of trip is, is gonna be best matched to their interests? Is it gonna be a zoo or a cycling or a trip to the beach? So you've really got to get to know each other. And then we started building itineraries kind of around that and um, started to tackle the more kind of practical and logistical parts um, around kind of last mile transport and lunches and if we needed passenger assist and all that good stuff. So I'll hand over to Troy now, who can tell us a bit more about what happened when all the fun started. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Elaine. So uh, we delivered 23 days out by rail and 160 young people took part in that. Some of them did two trips, so, um, but mainly it was one experience that young people had with us and it was a kind of a lengthy experience. So I suppose that's a real big difference between us and the other two pilots is that was that's what we did was one intervention usually. Um, we visited 10 different destinations. We worked with 12 partner organizations and we probably had contacts, you know, at the beginning with maybe 20. So not all those contacts bore fruit for different reasons. Really brilliantly, um, <clears throat> we designed a survey which we did decided because we only had one chance to talk to young people we decided to keep our survey really simple we had eight questions and they were nearly all agree disagree questions some of them were like what three word type of questions and there was a section for comments but we really didn't want to frighten young people off it was optional whether they did that or not but 70 percent of the young people who 
did the survey, which was most young people, said they felt more confident using the train after the experience that they'd had with us. And 83% brilliantly enjoyed spending time with others. And for us, that was really significant because we targeted partners who were working with young people who were experiencing loneliness due to social isolation. So that might be to do with homelessness or to do with um, being bullied maybe. Um, you know, poor mental health. Um, can we have the next slide, please, Elaine? Ooh, I'm trying. <laughs> there you go. So um, really our role as delivery facilitators was to create the scaffolding for interesting things to happen. And that was our, our baseline role. We got involved in all kinds of other stuff. We engaged with partners, we engaged with young people. But at the bottom line was we took care of the sort of nitty gritty bits so that the magic could happen within that. Um, this is just a sort of a list of the kind of areas that we worked in. It won't be new to you all. It's project management stuff, the transferable skills. Uh, you can see at the side of the slide, I don't know if you can see that properly, you'll be able to enlarge it if you take the presentation yourselves, but it's just an event plan. This one is for cycling, cycling sisters who um, are a group of young Muslim women. It's run by um, one of the local cultural Muslim cultural society and uh, seven young women came out on a cycling trip on the rail um, journey and had an amazing time. Lots of them had never been out in the country. Um, yeah, it's just an example of the, the importance of planning an organisation and having that as a baseline. And it includes things like uh, risk assessment and being clear about who's doing what in terms of managing risk. Next slide, please. OK, so what did young people say about the experiences that they had with us? This is just a, a small selection either from um, things that young people said directly to us when we were with them on the trips or from comments that they made in the survey on the day. Um, the thing that I particularly like is, this is the best day of my life. And that was said to me by a 17 year old young Somali refugee who was living on his own in Bristol, really didn't know many people. And we were out at Wild Place, which is a conservation project. And we were looking out over the Seven Estuary. And I think it was the first time he'd understood where Bristol was in the landscape, um, rather than just being located there and living, you know, day to day in the middle of the city. Anything that you'd like to pull out there, Elaine? Um, I'm really drawn to the quote at the top that says I, I was terrified of being on a train platform for ages and because it was a rational fear I didn't think I'd ever get over it but today I did. Incredible. Uh, that was a quote from a young woman who came on a trip with me from Gloucester, a 19 year old woman um, who's not currently in employment, education or training and was part of a program really trying to kind of look at what her next steps would be and um, she she had her eye on um, an engineering work placement in a place called Kemble near Sirencester and knew that if she wanted to apply for it, she'd have to get there by public transport. And before overcoming her fear of platforms that day, that opportunity seemed totally out of reach. And um, because she'd conquered it, she she planned to go home and, and think way more seriously about that, that application. So it just goes to show that those one-off experiences really can be life-changing to people. Thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, this is similar, but this is feedback from our partners. Um, lots of really positive feedback. People really appreciating the resource and the expertise that um, our rail partnerships were able to provide. Um, and the, the top middle one is great. That's from uh, a senior youth worker who came on several trips from Creative Youth Network. And she points out the transition on that one-off journey, the, the sort of metaphor, as well as the actual experience, is a transition from feeling really awkward and quiet to um, being in new environments and making new connections, which is something the previous two presentations have also highlighted. 
and you know just seeing them on the return with more confidence and excitement and I, I think that's just very clear evidence of the fact that this kind of intervention can be really powerful and it's something that rail particularly offers so um several partners said that the train itself was a workshop for them because people were facing each other uh, and also uh, young participants were able to choose where they sat according to where they felt comfortable and uh, youth and support workers could um, bring young people together and work on different aspects of what had happened or what was going to happen it was a really brilliant opportunity next slide please <coughs> Right, challenges and opportunities. So we've we've all experienced the challenge of industrial action, action and cancellations. Um, for us particularly, seasonality was a big deal because this was a pilot. It had a really tight delivery time frame, um, and by the time we were in place and had our structures and systems set up, it was October. Now you try convincing young inner city young people um, in their bright white trainers to go out for a walk in the mud in the middle of winter. It's really difficult. Um, we had to really think carefully about it. And what it meant was that we looked for places where we had wet weather mitigation. Um, so an example was the giraffe house at Wild Place, <laughs> which was like being in a giant fan heater. So it's fantastic. We take young people out there, they get really cold, really wet, and they dry off in the giraffe house with us. So we it meant we we thought outside the box more and we collaborated more with our, our partners and with destinations about what was appropriate. Um, but it also actually that very thing meant that although we'd started at the beginning, we'd been talking about taking young people for sort of, you know, challenging walks up peaks and mountains or in the middle of the forest, because we were thinking about nature experiences, actually, in the end, what we planned was probably better for inner city young people who weren't feeling confident because we took them to a place that was a springboard into a more natural experience without being overwhelming and putting them off ever getting on a train or going to nature again. So actually, it worked really well for us. It was a silver lining. Sorry, it's Elaine, I, I just got to interrupt just a second. Just we're down to maybe about a minute left for you guys. The last Thanks. slide. Thank you. Um, one off interactions. That was it meant that we had to rely more on our partners and work more closely with them and use their existing relationships with young people. But uh, also it made this experience very special. It, young people knew it was a one off experience. Our partners used it in that way. So sometimes it was the end of a program that young people were coming to or a series of one to one support. And actually, the whole experience of us delivering together as two community rail partnerships has been really fantastic for us. We've done lots of sharing practice. We understand more about each other's cultures and strategies than we did before. Uh, and we've supported each other a lot, Elena and I, and that's been really great to have that peer support for us. Next slide, please. Okay, so somebody, one of our partners tried to book a, a trip with us on Monday. Word has finally got out and people are coming to us. Hurrah, um, I had to explain that the pilot is coming to an end for us. And he sent me this quote. He, I work with young people from Bristol every day and most of them have never left the city. The pilot was an opportunity for vulnerable und underprivileged young people to have an experience that they would not have had otherwise. Not only that, for many of them, it was a new experience to travel on the train. Thank you. Um, over to you, David. Um, yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much, Troy and Elaine and Katie and Gareth and Miriam and Jules. I, I'm, I'm sure you can see it also from the chat as well. Um, you know that a lot of incredible outcomes have, have, have come from the work that we've done. Um, I can see from the chat also, obviously, that everyone's really, really keen to ask a lot of questions of our panelists. So we're going to break uh, for a comfort break until 11.40, as in 20 to 12. Um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to give you guys the opportunity to ask questions of our various panelists in a set of breakout rooms. Um, so 12 minutes from now, we'll be reconvening.
um, and I'll explain how that's going to work. Uh, and uh, yes, I, 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 I'm going to have to hurry. I'd, I'd love to gush a lot more about what the amazing things we've seen in those presentations, but um, but I think we're we've run over a little bit. So if we can um, come back at twenty to twelve at eleven forty, um, I'll see you all then, and then we're going to separate one another into breakout rooms. So yes, please go and have a a quick twelve minute break. Thanks. And just to say, it's important that people are back on time because once the breakouts are open. Um, people will automatically go in. All right. Thanks, David. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. See you all soon. Everybody will will now get set into a um, an individual breakout room, like his has just mentioned, with uh, one or the two of our panelists from each of the projects. This is your opportunity to ask them any questions that you might have had during those presentations, but also to have a a wider conversation, and they might ask you if you've had a thought about doing a similar project to this or you might want to do more projects in the in the sort of youth sphere and our, our team have a lot of uh, experience in in that kind of uh, working environment that kind of world especially that they've taken from this project and and also they've done a lot of new things as part of this project that we might have just discussed as if it was second nature but things like for instance working with the logic models were were new to most of the people that uh, that were involved in the project in some way shape or form so uh you as a community rail partnership i would hope would have a lot that you could ask but also a lot that you could be asked as well about whatever things might be on your mind when it comes to approaching a project like this for yourself so uh, 15 minutes per room, um, and the panellists will be moved between by Hannah and Hazel. That's right, isn't it, Hannah and Hazel? Sorry to <laughs> just thought this is my this is my chance to talk, so I want to take it. <laughs> That's the tech theory, David. <laughs> okay, Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. So we've got about 10 minutes left to sum up and bring the meeting to a close. I know those, I hope all of the other various breakout rooms were as productive and interesting as the one I was in. I think there were some really, really fantastic questions circulated around the various panelists. And it really showed to me, you know, just how much at attention and interest has been shown to the various different projects and, ri and rightly so. So um, just to quickly summarize, I suppose. So we've seen over the last year, we've delivered this pilot. We've reached over 400 young people with it. You've seen it, with some of the videos and some of the audio that we've seen and some of the photographs just how much impact that's made on some um some young people who are very very marginalized uh, as well and just how valuable this project's been um as part of next steps uh miriam and, and i will be working on a report that formalizes some of that information a bit more thoroughly uh, and that will be sent out to community real partnerships uh with interest and I'll summarize what we did, uh, what we achieved, some of the, um, a, a little bit more in depth of a look at some of the, the barriers and challenges that we had along the way and, and the various different recommendations we would have if we, if you were to replicate a project like that, or uh, if the institution as a whole was. Um, this has been a national project. We've run through three different regions around the country. We've managed to forge that partnership with Catch-22, which I realise now is something that several of the other community rail partnerships have done. So I think I'd also like to take that opportunity to thank Gareth and his team there for the amazing work they've done and the partnerships that they've built with our community rail partners. As, as somebody who was working from outside the organisation has always met the challenges of this project with an incredibly positive attitude, including today, uh, when he's, uh, I think, had about three hours of sleep, if that, or, or maybe none, uh, coming straight back from America to, to deliver this, uh, this presentation. Um, the team as a whole, uh, I joined uh, at the end of uh, August last year uh, to take on this project, and I had a background in youth work uh, myself, and it's been really fantastic to look at just how many different skills um, and creativity and the adaptability that our team has brought together and in, in, in putting this project together. And uh, as we've probably mentioned in the um, in the breakout room, some of these timescales that we've faced uh, have been quite tight and that's sometimes put quite a lot of, uh, of pressure on the people to deliver results quite quickly. And I think the, the way that the teams took up that challenge uh, and then and, and the amount of work they've delivered is a massive credit to the community rail as an organisation and the 
and the people that we've hired uh, and their abilities and their knowledge in the youth work sector as well. But I think at the same time, it's important to realize that a lot of this work was quite new to a lot of the of, of, of us in, in some ways across all the various different parts of the project, especially things like working with Miriam, which went uh, into realms probably unexplored by some projects at this, at, at this scale. And I think working with an academic partner was a really massive learning experience and it's given us a really rigorous evidence base for the project that we've delivered. Um, and one that I think will be something that we can reference in perpetuity, but also something that I think serves to show that relatively small partnerships can come together and deliver a project like this. Um, and that can be this impactful. So I just wanted to sum up that one part by saying just how massive a credit the people who've worked on these projects have been to the Community Rail uh, Network and, and just how grateful I am for the incredible work they've put in over the over the past year and um, how pleased and proud I am to have been involved in this project as well. Um, we've got some space for a few more questions and then I'm going to I'm going to pass on a bit of closing information. So I, I wondered if there was any if, if there was anybody who wanted to use the hands up function that I could call on just to give us a bit of feedback on what you found useful about this webinar or what you found particularly interesting or what you'd really, really like to know more about as well, if we get the chance to um, to ask. Um, participant list. Uh, Hazel, I can see you talking, but I can't hear the audio. Oh, sorry, it's it automatically mutes when I push it up. Um, mm. Elaine's coming in, actually. OK. Sorry, I know I'm probably not, um, I don't know if I'm entitled to say something because I was one of the panelists, but just very quickly, I just wanted to say what a pleasure it's been, not just working on the project, but today was really, really helpful for me because even though we've all been working on tackling loneliness with transport, I think a lot of people that haven't been working on this project might be surprised to know how little contact um, Gareth and Katie and, and I and Troy have necessarily had at any given point throughout. So, you know, I've taken quite a lot away in terms of, um, you know, what you guys delivered in Lancashire and, and in Durham, because although we were working on the same pilot, um, I felt quite quite far away from your delivery. So really, really interesting to hear more. And um, thank you for sharing. And I, I'm personally interested in maybe doing something more kind of arts based. So um, I may very well reach out to you in the future, Katie. Thanks. Um, do we have any more sort of uh, almost closing remarks from any of the uh, community real partnerships that we've that we've got um, um, joining? Try, us try is coming in. Okay. Troy, you're also on mute. I'm just going to unmute you. No, just do, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. This is unorthodox, I know, because we're both panelists, but um, I wanted to ask what the process is. This is a pilot with three different models. Um, I wanted to ask what the process is next and whether um, there, you know, lots of people have asked me in breakout rooms about legacy, and I know what our legacy is internally or with our partners or with community around that work i don't really know what happens presumably the pilot will be evaluated by the external evaluators and also by miriam for example um what happens next and what's the time scale for it and does anyone know it's a good point and i think it speaks to the nature of a project that's a one-year pilot and the things that are good about that and also maybe some of the things that are uh, a challenge are that while I, from speaking to everybody in the webinars, you can see how some of the new relationships that, for instance, you've built, Troy, have been bedded in with, to, to the best extent that we could within the time that we've had uh, within your local area. Um, so there's a few things that I, th that I know about at the moment. And one of the things I mentioned is this, that report where we'll bring together the data that's been collected by the various bits of surveying and evaluation workshops and interviewing that we did alongside Miriam. Um, and we also obviously brought all of our different contributors together. As Elaine mentioned, we've all been working remotely, so we haven't had a great amount of time to meet one another, but we did have a, a meeting on the 17th of April where we plunged together a ton of feedback about this. So that'll all be written up into one report that's due at the end of June. Um, 
there's a wider report being written about the project as a whole for DFT by Natsen, which is their uh, hired evaluator that's evaluating all of the various different um, projects that were delivered as part of the larger tackling loneliness with transport fund. So that's due in the autumn. And, uh, now they told me September, but um, whether that happens by then, time, who knows, because we've already had a bit of the project extension. So that might actually take a bit longer than originally thought. Um, and then uh, there has been some attempt so far, and I know there's going to be more um, in taking some of the work that we've done with this project to pitch similar types of projects to other funders in the future. So for instance, the one that's being worked on at the moment um, that I've passed on to Jules and Sarah is a, around mobility, which is another grant, which would run something similar to tackling loans with transport, but specifically with regards to people with disability and lived experience of disability. David, um, Gareth just had his hand up, so I've just asked him to unmute very quickly. I know we need to wrap up. Barbara, and then we'll wrap up if that's okay. Yeah, it's just, it is literally very quickly. And I just wanted to kind of um, replicate what some others have said. Um, to me, this has been a really fascinating piece of work. I think it's been invaluable. There's been some young people in the Northeast who have got a massive amount out of this. We will never, ever know how much it has impacted upon them if that legacy will continue forward. Um, it's been a privilege to work with some other some of the other people and the other partners from the community rail and I, like i've said before it's been you know i really acknowledge the the contribution that people i also acknowledge your contribution david and i'm sure the others from the other pilots will say exactly the same thing it's a it's a difficult job to do something up and down the country but very finally if there are any community rail partnerships from the northeast and i know there's a couple on here new college durham are definitely interested in wanting to continue to continue this as a piece of work so if anyone wants to reach out to them please get in touch with me and i'll get i'll pass the details on thank you fantastic thanks okay. gareth i think in that case and yeah and th thanks uh, again an amazing group of people to work with and i think for me it's it's just a shame that we only got to do it for the amount of time that we did yeah thank you everybody thanks so much for your time for your interest and thanks to our fantastic panelists gareth elaine troy Miriam, Katie, and obviously to Jules for all of the time that you've taken to put this together. It's been a fantastic summary of a really, really incredible project. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Well done, everyone. Thank Speak you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I will just end the meeting. David, you've got the recording, so. Yes. Bob. Great. Thanks.